Imagine the headline in Wall Street Journal, Swiss National Bank buys Bitcoin, dumps the Euro. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would uh, yeah. shake up the market. Hello and welcome to DeFire, your crypto storytelling podcast that's airdropping value straight to your ears in the form of insights and captivating stories. My name is Jonas and today on the show you hear the story of a Crypto Valley legend. Lucius Meiser is an entrepreneur, investor and the chairman at Bitcoin Swiss. He's also a computer scientist, economist and he knows a thing or two about law. This combination makes him a true triple threat in the world of crypto that sits at the intersection of new technology and economy and which is therefore often challenging old regulations. Now let me highlight three reasons why you want to stick around until the end of this episode. We start off as Lucius shares the story of how he managed to get in front of the Swiss national bankers and he urged them that they should be buying Bitcoin instead of German bonds. 2. Lucius tells us why Switzerland remains a top destination for crypto startups, also due to the laws he helped shaping. 3. Learn how he is now helping startups and small companies to tokenize their shares potentially laying the foundation for a currency stabilized and backed by the very fabric of the economy, its businesses. So make sure to listen to this episode to the very end to get the full picture. But before we start, a quick word from my side. Hey listeners, I'm happy to announce that I'm launching a brand new venture, podcasting as a service. If you have ever recorded a podcast, you know that it's a ton of work. Especially after you've done the fun part, which is the recording of the podcast, the real work begins. You need to make the sound good, edit the conversation, take out all these ums and ems, mix the podcast and master it, upload it to all the relevant channels and platforms. And that's not all. You also have to promote the episode, write show notes and the promo material, like those little videos for LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube or even TikTok. So wouldn't it be amazing if there would be a team of experts doing all of this work for you? So you can focus on what you're good at, having meaningful conversations with industry leaders. Well, that's exactly what you get when you partner with me. If that is something you and your company might be interested in, I would happily take you on as a client. It doesn't matter if you already have a podcast or if you want to launch one. This is a limited time offer, so don't hesitate to get in touch with me now to figure out the details. Send me an email to jonas at defire.money and we take it from there. That's jonas at defire.money. And now let's start the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Lucius Meister, you, you have um, so many titles. You're the chairman at Bitcoin Swiss. We're sitting here in your offices close to Bahnhofstrasse Zurich with your new company, Aktionariat. You're also an angel investor in many startups. You founded the Bitcoin Swiss Association a long time ago. But I want to start with a totally different thing. Recently, you went to the shareholder meeting of the Swiss National Bank. You stood up there and you basically told them, hey, you should buy Bitcoin. Can you tell the story? Like, how did that happen? What was the thinking behind it? Yes. So the thinking behind it, of course, is the Swiss National Bank should hold Bitcoins in its portfolio because it makes sense. It's uh, the digital gold. And I think sooner or later, all the national banks will hold some Bitcoins as a reserve currency. And the bank that moves first has an advantage. Like when they, for example, there was a big trend of selling gold. So in the 90s, national banks decided maybe gold is not what we need anymore. Gold is declining in value. Stocks are going up. Maybe we should sell gold and buy some stocks. That was at the peak of the bubble. And then Swiss National Bank had the worst timing, more or less, of all national banks and sold gold when it was... I don't know, $300 <laughs> an ounce or so, very low. Yeah. And I hope uh, history doesn't repeat. And this time we are first or earlier than others. And the Swiss National Bank is very special. It's a publicly traded company. You can buy shares. And if you own a share, you have the right to participate in the General Assembly as a shareholder. And every shareholder has the right to make a statement and to ask questions and to make proposals. That's what I did. So in May 2022, I went to the General Assembly of the Swiss National Bank. And it's also on video available because they record everything. Mm -hmm. and I watched it. <laughs> good. <laughs> and, and near the end, I said, dear Mr. Jordan, why don't you 
make yourself ready to buy some bitcoins when you feel like it. Mm -hmm. And his answer was, we are actually ready. He, he believes that operationally they could do it, but at the moment they don't feel like they need it to fulfill the purpose that they have. When you went up there, did you think there is a real probability that, you know, like obviously you think they should do it, but when you talk to people in finance, politics, etc., cetera, did, did you think you have a chance that they would do it? So in, in German, we say a steter Tropfen hüllt den Stein. So a steady current can dissolve the stone. So you need to reiterate your message again and again. And at some point, there's a chance that maybe they see value in it. Of course, uh, it's every year where Bitcoin is still there, maybe goes up a little, is still around. It's a year that makes Bitcoin more credible. And at some point, maybe when there's already a dozen other national banks that at the moment there's always El Salvador, then uh, Swiss National Bank will also jump on board because traditionally Swiss National Bank is one of the central banks that manages maybe the most stable fiat currency in the world. Mm -hmm. So it would be a huge statement. Imagine the headline in Wall Street Journal, Swiss National Bank buys Bitcoin, dumps the euro. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would uh, yeah. shake up the market. So it would it would be a big statement. Maybe that's also why they are a little afraid of it. But it would make sense in my opinion. And I did a dollar cost averaging. So what I did back then, I said, why don't you just move one billion, just one, start small, one billion <laughs> per month from German bonds to Bitcoin and see what happens. Today, they would have been up 20% whereas they would have lost 10% of the German bond portfolio because the euro went down relative to the Swiss franc. So it uh, would have paid off despite in between having quite a crash. But that's the magic of dollar cost averaging. If you buy something every month, then you can buy a lot when it's only at 15,000. You buy mm -hmm. twice as much as when it's at 30,000 or so. And that mm -hmm. way, it's, it's very efficient. And it's also a way to do it that doesn't need much psychological energy. That's one thing in trading. Decision taking is hard and takes a lot of energy. So if you have a system, you can reduce the energy needed to take a decision. Yeah. I heard that you want to, to basically that they get around 1% of all the Bitcoins because 1% is um, yes. the Swiss GDP in the world, right? Basically. Exactly. So that was my back of the annual calculation. The question, of course, is what's the target? And I think the target should be that Switzerland, having 1% of the world's GDP, should also own 1% of the world's Bitcoins. Okay. And how many months would they, would they need to buy one uh, billion worth of Bitcoin? That depends on the price, of course. Like so, uh, of course, currently? it's 200,000 200, 200, bitcoins, mm -hmm. 50,000, so it's, it's okay. a lot. <laughs> a, lo a lot, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you've always been early, because um, in my research, I also found an old email of yours, and I'm quickly going to read it. I'm not sure it was supposed to become public, but it made it around on Twitter, so I might as well just read it here. And you sent to someone, you sent, hey, Mark Benecker, yes. Mark Benecker, he's also a Swiss entrepreneur and angel investor. I'm toying with the idea of starting a Bitcoin ETF. Here's my master plan. Bitcoins have a market cap of about 100 million euros right now. So quite long ago. Bitcoins are only taken seriously as an investment vehicle by a small minority of enthusiasts. If Bitcoins could be traded on widely recognized trading venues in the form of an ETF, the gates would be open to larger amounts of capital and Bitcoin would gain credibility at the same time. Should Bitcoin succeed in establishing itself as an alternative investment, a tenfold increase in today's price is easily possible, perhaps even much more. That was, I think, almost 10 years ago, 2013, I guess. Yeah, 13 or 12. And now, of, of course, BlackRock, one of the biggest financial institutions of the world, actually filed exactly this idea with the SEC and many have tried before, but yes. still. Yes, many attempts have been made before in the US. Mm -hmm. So there are so different vehicles to trade Bitcoin through traditional exchanges, certificates, ETPs, exchange trade products and so on. But it's actually very hard. And I don't think the SEC is worried about uh, custody risk. I think they are worried about market manipulation. That's what they say. But market manipulation applies to futures and to Bitcoins likewise. So it's... But it, what I found interesting as well is 
you're thinking that you said, okay, it could 10x from here. If <laughs> yeah, <there>. now it's <laughs> 1,000x. <laughs> exactly. And still people now were bullish because of the ETF. And I wonder, do you still believe like if this ETF would happen? Because we already have so many financial instruments to actually buy Bitcoin with the future uh, contracts. And also it's becoming more easily to buy actually just Bitcoin itself. I mean, we have companies like MicroStrategy buying tons and tons of Bitcoin all the time. Do you still think that's such a bullish signal as a couple of weeks back in crypto Twitter, it was like all the rage? I think it's a bullish signal. And if they succeed, it would certainly open the gates even wider. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what do you think is the chances? If Bitcoin survives, which I assume because it's been around for 10 years, it's hard to kill. So regulators don't seem to like it. There's different initiatives to suppress crypto. But it's just a question of time because soon I still believe in the legal system that it works, that if the SEC is wrong, that the SEC's decision can be corrected through the legal system by going to court and so on. Unfortunately, that takes a lot of time. But sooner or later, I think there's no way around approving such a thing. Mm -hmm. And it would be an opportunity for Switzerland. So in Switzerland had one with Fondobel, they had a certificate very early on, a Bitcoin spot certificate, which was very successful. I think they had uh, one or two billions very soon. Wow. But it was destroyed by the capital requirements. So FINMA imposed very strict capital requirements. And now the Basel committee is imposing even stricter capital requirements, which essentially say, as a bank, if you issue a certificate and you owe someone a Bitcoin, even if you have this Bitcoin present in the background, you still need an additional worth of Bitcoins in dollars in equity capital. So that means if you have 1 billion in Bitcoin certificates outstanding and you have 1 billion Bitcoins on your balance sheet, you need still an additional Bitcoin in equity. You need actually 2 billion to have 1 billion capitalized and it's absurd that the regulators don't really appreciate this hedging here. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not... Uh, set in stone yet so it's there's these international recommendations for uh, capital requirements but there's an even stricter requirement that's incoming so there's different approaches uh, to, to regulating the classic approach is regulate most governments including the swiss one they said we, we regulate we just apply the established rules as good as we can to crypto but this is not what the basel committee follows so there's the two other alternatives to discuss besides uh, regulate is contain and ban. And they said, we cannot ban it. It wouldn't be accepted. You cannot do that in a liberal society. Maybe we go for contain. And as part of that strategy, they said a bank should have at most 1% of its balance sheet in crypto. Mm -hmm. Just to, the idea is to build a firewall between the established financial system and decentralized finance. And this destroys the business model of a crypto bank like we have in Switzerland. Because it means if you have 1 million in crypto on your balance sheet, you need 100 million in equity. Wow. And this makes no sense at all. It's 100x? 100x. It makes no sense at all. You don't need to be an accountant to recognize that the maximum possible loss in the worst, absolutely worst case, if you have 1 million in Bitcoin, is that you lose 1 million because the price cannot drop below zero. Everything that goes beyond that is pure politics. Yeah, I understand. And do you think this ties in a little bit into, like we, we've heard that word, Operation Choke Point 2.0, that's more US focused, right? Like where it seems as the SEC is raging a war against crypto. Do you think behind the curtains, I'm not conspiracy minded at all, but it's the same underlying thinking and current that's going on right now, like this anti-crypto. So I don't think there's a conspiracy, but I think some people are uh, worried and extremely risk averse. And maybe for politicians, it's a way to signal that there's strict regulation. Mm -hmm. Because you have to also see the position of the regulators. They see there's scams, there's uh, maybe fraud, there's uh, blackmailing. So th this is one of the worst things. So th th if, if there's malware that encrypts your hard drive and someone blackmails you if you want your data back, send a Bitcoin here and there. This, of course, is very bad PR for Bitcoin. And rightly so, because it shouldn't be there to be abused. 
And then, of course, there's pressure to do something against it. Yeah. Now we've come a long way, we got, got quite into detail, but I wanted to also build this bridge back to who you've been at that time when you wrote this email. Would you have imagined back then when you wrote this, as I said, market cap of Bitcoin was 100 million, right? Today, you launch a shitcoin and the pumps up to a billion very quickly. It was different times, but could you have imagined that Bitcoin would become what it has become today? And who were you at that time when you wrote that email? What, what was your setting? What was your story? So I studied computer science and after my studies, together with a friend, we created a cloud storage company, which was encrypted and distributed for, for secure data storage. And so, so I had a sense for both distributed systems and cryptography. And this helped me a lot in recognizing the value of crypto. So. And we sold that uh, cloud storage company and I was active in the venture capital space. So that and was 2000 that, and do you remember when, when that was around what time? I would say 2013 or so. 2013. You were f your first and that was your first startup and you had the exit. Uh, the, the exit was in 2009 and the startup okay. was created in 2007. Oh, very quick. Yes. And that, but I stayed with it until 2013. Yeah. And then suddenly you had some money and you started to invest in startups and also in Bitcoin. I bought the first Bitcoins in 2011. Okay, quite early on. What was the price back then? I don't even know. So 2011 was a very volatile year. It started below $1 and it peaked at $31 and I bought at 13 or so. So okay. yeah. but that was super early and then a long time not so much happened, right? Or did you have to feel no, no, it, was... it was very volatile. Yeah. Much more volatile than today. I invested the first time in Ethereum 2016, and then it went up quite a lot. Uh, yes, yes. And once you are on that roller coaster, you, it's hard to get off. It's a little bit addicting. Like once you've seen something going 100x, it's oh okay. Now I'm paying more attention to this all the time, and you get a little bit attached to those. What should be a technology becomes a little bit more sometimes for some people, yes. right? Yes, yeah. Ethereum was a game changer because it introduced the model of the ICO. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people copied it and a lot of people threw money at it and it was too much, I think. You know, it was a big bubble and, and a lot of projects that didn't produce anything tangible. Yeah. And I think it's also the ICO model is broken because the investor doesn't get anything tangible. The investor gets a token mm -hmm. with no rights attached. Yeah. Just... And, the currency... Yeah, but it's, it's sometimes... So for Ethereum, it works because there's an ecosystem and then it, the, the, it, it was the currency of the ecosystem. But for an investment vehicle in, in general, you should have something with a bundle of rights, like when you buy a share or a bond. And, and that's one of the things that I think has a much brighter future than the tokens that have no tangible rights attached. And... We see the development going that direction. If you look at the uni token, it can shape the future of the system. So it's a little like a share with voting processes and maybe there's ways to funnel some of the profits to the token holders and then it functionally becomes a share. Mm -hmm. And here, of course, we, I, I understand the regulators very well that say this is a security, even though it doesn't fulfill the formalities of a security it functions as a security. It's an investment instrument and you can raise money and you can govern a company, you can vote, you can get dividends kind of. Of course, then it's, it also calls for similar regulation. And then the problem is when you just apply the existing regulation for securities, there's a lot of friction where it doesn't match because it is not the same. It's kind of different. And then the question is, would you like to create completely new regulation? So this is the European Union approach. European Union said this is something new, a new type of investment instrument. We need the MICA framework for crypto assets that uh, governs it a little differently from securities. And the Swiss approach is much different from the European approach. The European approach is there's something new. We need a new directive that only tackles this problem and everything about crypto. And the Swiss approach was there's something technically new but we look at the existing law and change the existing law where it is necessary to make the law able to deal with this. Yeah. And this is the much more future-proof approach 
because it's based on fundamental principles. And when something new comes, we just think about how should we apply the fundamental principles to the new thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't create a completely new law. And this makes Switzerland a good place for crypto, right? You mentioned that the parliament did this, but if I'm not mistaken, you had also your fingers in this. You helped to give advice, etc. I was consulted as an expert by the Federal Council. And uh, this was very interesting uh, to, to be involved in that and to provide inputs and to have discussions. So, How does that work? Do they just call you up and say, hey, Lucius, how much time do you have to invest? What is the form? Do you meet somewhere in Bern and sit around the table? Or is it like so, a Zoom call? Or? This was in person, a few meetings. There's a proposal for a new law. There's the Botschaft, the message for the law where the reasoning is explained and there they also listed all the experts that helped. And I'm one of the, I don't know, 20 or so experts that are named there. So first, the, the project needs kind of a sponsor. So if no one in the government wants to create a law, then not much happens because the members of parliament themselves, most of the time, they don't write the law. So in this case, it was Willy Maurer who felt there's an opportunity for Switzerland and created a working group and said, this working group should figure out how we should adjust our existing laws to realize the potential of this opportunity. And then, of course, there was the public consultation afterwards where we again took part. All the cantons uh, filed their ends for all the parties filed their ends for all the interested communities and, and, and associations filed their comments. And I like this process a lot. So oftentimes, of course, they don't listen. And in the end, it's a compromise. There's a lot that is different than what I would have done, mm -hmm. but it was a big step forward. And what's particularly nice is that Swiss law now has an explicit article that says, essentially, so I'm paraphrasing, not your keys, still your Bitcoins. Okay. So normally we say not your keys, not your Bitcoins, but in, under Swiss law, if you give your Bitcoins to Bitcoin Swiss or another Swiss custodian and he fulfills the criteria of the law, which Bitcoin Swiss does, and is nicely segregated and so on, then these Bitcoins legally are still yours, which means that if the custodian goes bankrupt, you don't have to share these Bitcoins with anyone else. You get them back. Whereas with a US custodian, so if you are with a US crypto broker and they go bankrupt and the IRS comes and says, you owe us 100 million, Maybe they sell the Bitcoins to, to, to pay the debt with the IRS and you get nothing. So I think I've seen this sometimes shared on crypto Twitter with, uh, with Coinbase, that you never own the stuff that you have on there, for instance. Is that the term that would make the difference in Switzerland? Yeah, so what you need to do under Swiss law to make sure that... So if you are a custodian, you need to commit to the client to say, I keep these cryptocurrencies available at all times. I don't use it anywhere else, so I don't secretly lend it to someone. I don't secretly stake them and uh, take all the profits. I keep them here and do only what you want me to do with it. And there's one legal question which probably the lawmakers didn't think of is what happens if I keep your ether and you tell me to stake them on your behalf and there's Two questions. One question, legal question is, if I stake them and they are lo locked, are they still available within the meaning of the law? Oh, wow. Okay, I don't know. And, <laughs> That's a good and, question. <laughs> and, and, and if you look at the purpose of the law, and this is what I think is the right interpretation, is to say what the lawmakers want to prevent is that the bank or whoever is the custodian secretly lends it to someone or does like with the securities lending that there it has happened in the financial crisis and no one knew who the securities uh, actually belonged to so they, they didn't want this to leave the control of the custodian and it with available they meant it has to be present it doesn't mean you need to be able to to give it back within a second because there can be all kind of reasons that you cannot immediately give it back maybe there's a lockup period right Usually. yes there's a lock that's a technical reason and, but there may be, sometimes the regulators tell you, you have to freeze the assets of this client. And then, of course, this cannot immediately disqualify it for, from being a custody relationship. Or maybe you use it as a collateral for a loan. Then, of course, the custodian is also not allowed to move it until you have repaid the loan. So there's many scenarios that 
Or maybe there's a public holiday and no one is in office. And then, of course, you also need to wait the day until you can get it back. Yeah. And that's, to me, it's quite clear that this cannot be meant by the purpose of the law. But there's others that see a risk in that and say, if you do staking, then it's not custody anymore. So this is a very high level technical discussion that is still much further than in most other countries. So I'm not a lawyer, so it all comes with a caveat. But uh, generally, I think Switzerland has a very solid and robust foundations for the custody of crypto. And that's why custody in Switzerland is the second best option after storing Bitcoins yourself. Uh, that, that's, that's interesting because... We, we hear a lot about this crypto nation Switzerland, but still we don't have companies here that have this shining power, that, the international power, right? We don't have an international exchange here. And it sounds like we, we would have actually a very good fertile ground to have such an exchange. And you, you yourself have been involved with Bitcoin Swiss, which is a broker and not an exchange. Why don't we have an exchange? Why is, for instance, Bitcoin Swiss not an exchange? Is, is there something missing still? First, it's very hard to build an exchange and Switzerland is rather small. And so it's just a matter of probability. So it's not that probable that we, do, we don't have to expect this. There will be a lot of change, but it's, uh, I would say the, uh, we are still in a high cost and rather restrictive environment. So we have a lot of legal certainty. We have a lot of good regulation, but we also have some of the maybe even the highest standard in the world when it comes to things like KYC. And, and this also creates some friction. And I think it's part of the strategy of the regulator to have the Swiss finish, to always be a little tougher and a little more complicated than everyone else. And this, of course, keeps the bad guys out because they, they tend to go to the place where it's the easiest to do something. But also, most other users tend to go to a place where there's the least friction. So this could be one factor. So the, and this, of course, is a trade-off. International listeners will be now, what the hell? Um, isn't Switzerland this kind of like paradise with the, the banking secret, etc.? How no, come no. Switzerland is so tough I all think of a sudden? It, it, this was a big change. So in the 90s, Switzerland and Swiss banks, they, they had a lot of... Uh, money from all over the world that was often not properly declared. So there was a lot of tax evasion and there was a big uh, clampdown on that. So it, you can also see this on, on a GDP number. So Swiss banking at some point, I think was 8% or so of Swiss GDP. Now it's at 2.5% or so of GDP. And you can, see, so if you look at the top 10 banks in the 90s, UBS and Credit Suisse were both in there, in the top 10 banks in the world. Now, UBS and Credit Suisse combined are somewhere in the top 50. And they are combined now. Yes. yes. And so Swiss banking has completely changed in reality, but it has not changed in Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. But you know, it's interesting. We talk a lot about banks here. Why? What, what happened to the Bitcoin spirit? Uh, this is an excellent <laughs> question. So the big problem with crypto is that it's not so user-friendly. Of course, you get the power to keep your wealth under control, but for 95% of the users, it's more comfortable to have a relationship to a trust intermediary. And this is something where Switzerland can shine. So as a country, we always need to think, how can we make sure that we are more wealthy than our neighbors? What can we do better than everyone else? So uh, there's a lot of politicians that always think about how can we be as compatible as possible to everyone else? How can we harmonize everything? But mm -hmm. if you do everything exactly the same as your neighbors, then you need to ask yourself, why do you believe that we still be more wealthy than everyone else? So we need to do something different and better. And that's also healthy. You, you need to have uh, competition. Also, it's, it's not good to have a regulatory monoculture, especially in a very innovative field. So you need to have different uh, ideas that can be tried out. And uh, well, what was the original question? Uh, Why are we talking so much about banking? Ah, uh, yes. And then, of course, uh, Switzerland is a good place traditionally to build a trusted intermediary because we have a very stable legal system. We have a low crime. We are 
known to be reliable uh, on time and so on. So uh, some of this is cliche, but some of this I think is true. And we can use that to build intermediaries for the crypto ecosystems. And Bitcoin Swiss has exactly this role. It's a gateway into and out of crypto. And there's always a need for that. This will, won't go away. I don't believe in all these different uh, tricks to create wallets where you don't need to know the private keys because they're social recovery or, or things like that. It's, I think in the end, what most users want to have is they want to be able to call someone if something goes wrong. If they've lost their keys, they want to be able to call someone and have a nice answer and say, here, we have recovered everything and then they are fine. They want someone who helps them to navigate the jungle that is DeFi. It's very easy to lose a lot of money. I think there's a big role to play for a trusted partner that guides you through this jungle. And here we are actually quite good. So we have these two crypto banks so far and Bitcoin Swiss aspires to be also one of them someday. But it's not a bank yet and it's also not an exchange, it's a broker. Yes. And I think this is a good business model. The Swiss banking license is a seal of quality and we can offer very high quality services. Uh, one problem, of course, is that it's not very portable. So you cannot ad advertise banking services in Germany if you're a Swiss bank. So you always need to find ways to get approvals to do that. But apart from that, it's a very good location to build something like this. Mm -hmm. But in summary, why are we talking about the banks and what happened to the, the spirit of being your own bank and of DeFi and uh, self-custody, etc. is okay, people actually need help, they need intermediaries. And Switzerland is well positioned for that in terms of the law, right? But when it comes to companies, we don't have so many. Like I, I use Kraken, for instance. I used to use Binance as well. Not, not anymore, but... I mean, Ethereum was started in Zug, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. We just had Ripple acquiring for 250 million, uh, I'm not sure, Metaco, which one they acquired, yes, they acquired Metaco, right? Swiss company, a when? custody company, months ago or so. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this was quite big. Mm -hmm. So there's more happening than in many other countries, but of course there could be more. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, why aren't the big exchanges coming? I would say... All the big exchanges in the world, they looked at Switzerland as a jurisdiction to build European headquarters or whatever, but it didn't catch on. Yeah. I have maybe a question that is coming from a totally different perspective. I've, I've seen on your website that you are a big fan of an author who wrote some uh, sci-fi books, a trilogy. And I, uh, yes, Asimov. Asimov, the foundation trilogy. Yes, yes. Can you, for listeners who don't know the books, me included, I don't know it. Why is, was that so important for you? What's going on with those books? So this is when I started the PhD with the topic of agent-based simulations. And the idea was to use computer simulations to simulate the economy and so on. The book doesn't have one protagonist throughout it. It spans over centuries, so people come and go. But there's one person, which is Harry Selden, which is a mathematician who figured out the equations and how to calculate the future. And then he became super powerful. He didn't use it to become powerful. So he recognized the galactic empire is doomed. It will collapse. There's nothing we can do about it. But what we can do, we can make the barbaric age that will follow as short as possible by making sure that we preserve knowledge and create the seeds for the next civilization. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and uh, the, the, this is the basic plot. And then, of course, at some point, his predictions go wrong because something unpredictable happened and then they need to fix it. And, and has that somehow influenced your real life work? Because it's on your website and say, you, you mentioned something about running some own simulations and some ah, low yes, yes. So this was my ambition when I started PhD, but then I got sucked back into crypto. Okay. And, uh, so I did some simulations, but I didn't do much progress on that front. And I also don't want to brand you, by the way, only with Bitcoin, because we talk a lot about Bitcoin. But I also know that you're interested in other protocols as well, which I appreciate because I, I don't like people who are, are maxis. I think nobody really likes them. But that being said, I have some questions about Bitcoin for you. 
and also with the idea maybe of simulation looking to the future. One of the questions is that everybody has is like, how does Bitcoin survive going forward a couple of years when so many halvings have occurred that miners have little incentive to keep the network going? What is your take on that? So the halving doesn't matter from a security perspective if the price is double. So in dollar terms, it's still the same amount of security. Also, if you... But that's a big if. if yeah, you... that's a big if. It means uh, the price has to double every four years. Yeah. And this cannot happen forever. This makes it somewhat experimental, of course, and it makes the outcome unknown. But I'm not so worried about that. So it's uh, especially for the use case of digital gold, you can also be very patient and say, okay, instead of waiting for three confirmations, I wait for 10 confirmations. And then you have three times the security. Is, would that be an adoption with the tech that you say, okay, we wait longer until it's you know, secure? No, this is just when you receive one Bitcoin, you wait a little longer until you consider the transaction confirmed. Okay. And then you're on the same level as before. Yeah, but the argument is it would make this, the system more prone to attacks. It would make it slower to get the same level of security. Mm -hmm. And this is okay for the use case of digital gold. If a national bank needs to move one billion in Bitcoin to another national bank, it's okay if they have to wait for one or two days. Are you also interested in real gold? Do you care about gold? Yes. So I think gold is not so interesting. It's similar to Bitcoin, but for an investor, it has no yield. It's like Warren Buffett wouldn't buy gold. Yeah, he has this quote like, first you pay people to dig it out and then you pay people to stand around it and protect it. Yes, exactly. So, it, And that's why I think Bitcoin is very special. It's the digital gold. It has a special role. And... All the other currencies that come up, they need to find another purpose. You cannot beat Bitcoin in the role of digital gold. So they can try to be a better means of payment or they can be investment instruments. And here I see a lot of potential. And if you look at the traditional financial system, the market for gold is much smaller than that for bonds or stocks or currencies. Mm -hmm. So if Bitcoin is just digital gold, it can easily go up tenfold again, but it, but somewhere there's a limit. Yeah. And that seems to be now the, the accepted narrative as well, right? I think now it has settled on digital gold. When Bitcoin increases in value, does it take away market cap from gold or is it like a magic expansion of this kind of category of gold and digital gold? I would say so. So I know one bank, for example, that they used to have the policy of saying we allocate 5% of the assets of our clients to gold in our sample portfolio. And now the sample portfolio is 2.5% gold and 2.5% Bitcoin. And this is one case where someone directly substituted gold for Bitcoin. And I would say Bitcoin is the better gold because one is the envir environmental impact, of course. A lot of gold is mined under uh, not so nice conditions. And one is the transferability and uh, that you can store m one billion worth of Bitcoin on a piece of paper, if you like to. Uh, that's interesting. So that would also mean, basically, it's a, the gold people are afraid of Bitcoin because it's a competition, a real competition. It's also a business opportunity. So a lot of gold people are very friendly to Bitcoin. Interesting. I didn't know that because I only know Peter Schiff. So that's why. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course, there's, there's some radicals. But there's also a lot of uh, gold web shops that uh, accepted Bitcoin for payments early on. So I think there's an alignment. Okay. Now we dedicated a lot of this discussion to, to Bitcoin. But of course, in your day to day, you probably use Ethereum much more or other smart contract platforms because we're sitting here in a company that is using Ethereum to tokenize. Uh, it's called Aktionerat and it's tokenizing uh, equity of Swiss private companies. So little companies that are not yet publicly traded, but they have like a, a certain uh, legal construct, which is AG, which I think in English is a... Sh what is an AG in English? Do you know that? Public corporation. But it's not public. Yeah, but it's not public. In so there's no direct... But you have shares. Translation, yeah. There are shares that are freely transferable. 
So the distinction in Switzerland and many other European countries is you have the GmbH, the Limited Liability Corporation, and you have the AG, in French it's a SA, Société Anonyme. The main distinction is that you can transfer it and you don't need to update the centralized registry every time. It, so it depends on the company. But in Switzerland, at least, the shareholder registry is kept by the company itself for the AG. And for the GmbH, you always have to go to the notary when you transfer shares. So it's not uh, easily transferable. And in Switzerland, we have a lot of companies with freely transferable shares. We have like 120,000 AGs, whereas Germany only has like 10,000. Oh, why? It's because the Germans overregulated the AG in comparison to the Switzerland. For example, they say if you create an AG, you need to create a Betriebsrat, which is a council for the employees where they can complain about wages and holidays and all these kind of things. So it comes with a lot of paperwork that the Swiss equivalent doesn't have. So in Switzerland, this is one of the most popular legal forms to create a company. And thanks to the new blockchain law, it's, it's possible to issue shares in the form of tokens. So traditionally, you can issue shares on paper. You print them on paper and then the law says the paper is the share and we transfer the paper, you automatically transfer the share. If you find the paper of the share in the street, for example, you're the owner of the share, kind of. Of course, you have the obligation to give it back, but it's it's by law, it's attached to the paper. And the same law is now has been adjusted for tokens. So if the company says we issue shares in the form of tokens, by law, the token is attached to the share. And whenever you transfer the token, the share is transferred and you cannot transfer the share without the token and you cannot transfer the token without the share. So it's atomically bound together. But there's still two things. If I got hacked, let's say like this, and my share of your company is stolen, that then this person is a shareholder of yours and I can't do anything about it. Or it's if someone, so we, for example, we tokenize the shares of Aktionariat of our company. And if someone hacks a wallet of a shareholder and steals the token, they have the shares. It's like when they steal the paper, they have the paper. But then if you want to enjoy your rights as a shareholder, and this is the same for all registered shares. On paper, they solve it like this. If I sell a share to you, I write your name on the paper and sign it and give it to you. That's uh, the transfer. And then you can go to the company and say, look, this person has given the share to me. Please put me in the registry and send the dividend to me in the future. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, you get the dividend. But if you forget to register, I still get the dividend. So it's a two-step process. First, you get the token. Then you need to register as a shareholder. And at that point in time, if you have stolen the shares and the previous shareholder complained, the company might help the previous shareholder to go to the police and to recover the shares or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you cannot just adjust the register. So the company cannot just say, we now move the share back to the legitimate owner. Yeah, it's on the blockchain. This takes, yes, this is on the blockchain. Of course, you could create a smart contract with this force transfer function and so on. But I think this is not in the spirit of the law. The, the spirit of the law is like with the paper. The paper is atomically bound to the share. And if the paper gets stolen, you need to use the legal system to get the paper back. Under some circumstances, you can declare it invalid and issue a new one. So, but this, this is some also process. So, and you can do the same with the token. Maybe you lost access to the token and so on. So there's legal procedures to declare old token invalid and issue a new one, but generally you shouldn't have a function where the issuer can just take the shares back. But the big difference is when you have the paper, there is not like a liquid market for it. And I believe what you want to build and what also is one of the huge benefits of Aktionariat is there will be a secondary market of those shares that should be on chain and liquid. So the, the, so the, the hacker will be able to sell this for a profit. Yes, yes, this is a risk so that the hacker steals the shares and uh, doesn't register but sells it on an exchange. So there's always this trade-off when you want to have freedom, the f freedom and, and the open market can be abused. And uh, so far, we didn't see this happen. It's of course a risk. And uh, in such a case, I would say we need to build this infrastructure where we kind of can't, so this infrastructure already exists. So there's companies like Elliptic that track uh, funds. And you could maybe then go to the company and report 
these shares have been stolen, please track where these funds are moving. And if it's also a decentralized exchange, you can exactly track now. Yes, it's been swapped to the US dollars. Now it's been swapped to Swiss francs. And now someone sent it to this or that exchange. And as soon as they get to the gateway to the traditional financial world, they can be identified. And what was the thinking behind it? Why did you start this company, Aktionariat? So I, I was involved with the creation of the law and I thought someone needs to do this. And <laughs> but there was no need from you because you're also a VC, you invest in companies. You didn't see this, you know, like I, I thought maybe it was a pain point for you or for some companies that you are invested in to, to raise money to make this happen, then not necessarily, it's more principle-based. Yeah, yes, it's also a mission to make blockchain technology useful. This is kind of an attack to the crypto guys, but I think it's valid because they tend to create a bubble. Coins that reference each other and then you have bubbles on top of bubbles. It's very self-contained without much connection to the real world. And one way to create a connection to the real world and to have a real world use case is to create tokens that represent an asset in the real world. Uh, you can see it as a mission to make blockchain technology useful and to use the power of this new financial system to allocate resources to the real economy and not only into uh, another blockchain project that does something completely virtual. And this obviously is now a good message for the, 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 the crypto people listening, but how would you, if I would be like a small company, how would you sell it to me? Your, you know, what Aktionariat is. Why should I be using Aktionariat if I would have a company? So it, it depends on uh, your situation. So it's not a good instrument at the seed stage. But as soon as you maybe have some clients, maybe you have some traction, maybe some income that you can show, you get a value that can be appreciated from the outside. And then you can start... For many, the first step is to tokenize the shares and allow employees to buy some shares or maybe business partners or suppliers. Whoever already knows you and wants to build a relationship with you. So it can be used as a tool to create a bond to clients or to other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, once it's bigger and once these markets also need to develop, and, and here we have a lot of innovation with uh, new ways to organize a market like a lot of people think Uniswap created the liquidity pools because it's not gas efficient to create an order book on chain. This might have been the inspiration, but actually they created something that's superior in many cases. It's a better way to structure market in many cases and to create liquidity without having a professional market maker that has a lot of fees and something. Because of those liquidity pools, basically, yes. that you always can tap in, it's always ready for a, some form of liquidity. Is that liquidity? Is yes. that the, the idea? Yes. Why I think it's superior? I Yes, I would say that the concept of liquidity pools managed by smart contracts without need for human intervention is much more efficient and more suitable for smaller companies than traditional exchanges. On a traditional exchange, I think if you are at market cap below half a billion, uh, no one recommends to go there because there's a lot of overhead and, and processes and market makers that need to be paid and you still don't get a very liquid market. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of potential for innovation to create liquidity and to organize markets in new ways. And there's also a lot of potential to use then this for other purposes like uh, collateralized loans or to back a stable coin. Okay, basically the, with those startups or with those companies, you would take those tokens and then use them again in other DeFi primitives like a stablecoin, for instance. For example, yes. And then you get a new financial system. You get the long tail of the financial system. And maybe the same happens as with the news through the internet. So traditionally we had TV and everyone watched TV, the news at the same time and the same news. I think there was 1.5 million Swiss viewers, quarter of the population or a fifth of the population in the 80s or so that watched the same news every day on the same channel, very centralized. And now in the internet age, everyone has their own feed, their own uh, TikToks or whatever they take the information from. And it's very fragmented and individualized. 
and there's much, much more happening. And the information is spreading faster. It's harder to suppress information. It's uh, more open and democratic. It's also a little more chaotic. There's some pessimists out there that think uh, news are generally in decline, but I think it's more the traditional outlets that are in decline that need to rethink their business model. And in general, if you are open-minded, you can get hold of a lot more information and a lot wider spectrum of information than in the past. And something similar could happen uh, with investing. So we might be able to catch the long tail, just like today, every small block can compete with the New York Times. Every small company can start offering its shares through its website to whatever audience it wants to. Of course, that doesn't mean that someone from the other end of the world needs to buy shares of a Swiss company. It doesn't make much sense. You always need to ask yourself as an investor, how do I add value? But there's many ways. Maybe you are a consumer. You know this brand is excellent. This is the best watch ever or this is the best uh, whatever product it is. And then you can buy these uh, shares and take part in the company. If you look at the number of listed companies, it's in decline. So in Switzerland, there's 230 listed companies on the Swiss stock market, but there's half a million companies in Switzerland. It's a, only a very small fraction that is listed and publicly tradable. And companies tend to go public later and later. And this also means that most of the value of the growth of the company is captured by an elite of investors, uh, venture capitalists and private equity specialists and so on, and is not available anymore to your pension fund. And in a world where you have access to a much broader spectrum of companies, it might also be possible to get in earlier again and to capture more of the value creation. But wouldn't you say, because from a company's perspective, as you mentioned, one use case is to incentivize your own employees and to raise funds, right? And usually yes. you would go to VCs or like for people with domain expertise that help you achieve your goals. And for me, it's always a little bit of a red flag if like suddenly a company that I use, for instance, in this neo bank, Neon, and they, they send me emails and ask me for money to invest in their company. I'm not sure if they're using Aktionär yet. Unfortunately not. Okay. So they don't use it, but we can also use a different example. And for me, it's a little bit of a red flag. It's like, okay, why are they asking me for money? Don't they get money from the good investors? Because I'm not an investor myself, like a VC, but you have a, you're much closer to that community. That actually good companies have it easy to raise money, right? If you're a good company, you get the money. And for me, it's a sign of adverse selection. Like, why do they come to me? Is that a sign that this company is not so good? The last resort is, is me, you know? It could also be a sign that it's not a company that checks all the boxes that VCs are looking for. For example, one of the company that to we tokenized first is called quit.ch. Which you are an investor With in. double T, yes. Yeah. And this is a company that is very Swiss. It helps you to pay your household employees and handles all the Swiss bureaucracy around that. And this is not something that can be easily scaled to other countries. It's also a company that never had this hockey stick phase where they just grew like crazy. It's just stable growth every year, 20 to 30% growth, which is but that's fabulous. A, but that's it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, but it's not good enough for a venture capitalist. A venture capitalist wants to see 100% growth or 10% per month or whatever. So they, they want to see something with a lot of traction that is on a track to become a unicorn within five years. And they cannot show that, but they, they have a stable business. They're even profitable. And that is a different profile. And there's a lot of companies that don't match the profile of traditional investors, but there's still good companies. Mm -hmm. But there's, you mentioned, how many thousands of AGs do we have? 120,000. I think the majority of them are not such use cases yes. and they still get funding. I think or they fund themselves. Most of them are small and bootstrapped and self-funded. And maybe it's a, a business that doesn't need external capital. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a dentist. Why would you in, buy shares of a dentist? Doesn't make that much sense, I would say. Okay, so we have these companies and now you suddenly have a price attached to your 
it's almost like you publicly traded now, although you're not, but it's on the secondary market, right? And before that, probably those shares could still be traded and the price would have been, I don't know how the price ex comes together, but now you, you, you have more work because you have to show these numbers and you have to inform. And, and the, yeah, what, what happens then in the secondary market? I, I still have a little bit of a question mark how this then really works at, at the end. We don't really know yet because so far we don't have a well-functioning secondary market. What we can do so far is we can create a continuous investment opportunity where you can buy shares all the time. As in our case, it's possible to sell shares again because we buy them back. But many of our clients, they choose not to do that. They say we sell shares, but we don't buy them back and there's no market maker. And here the market still needs to develop. And I think for very small companies, it's very difficult, but for the larger ones, if you have a market cap of 50 million or 100 million, there is hope that we can create a market. But of course, a market can only function if there's an ecosystem around it. There needs to be some market maker and there need to be some standards for publishing performance indicators. So that, 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 that can be translated to actionable insights that then uh, market makers can trade on. All of this needs uh, to be developed. And what we know is that the traditional system doesn't work. You cannot say you need to publish a quarterly report that's audited by this and this firm and all these standards and so on. This would be an overkill for a small company. So what I aim for is having one key metric that is frequently updated. For example, Quits, the company I mentioned, they publish their key metric automatically straight out of the database every month. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the total amount of salaries processed. Okay. They process, uh, I think, six million worth of salaries per month and they take a small cut on that. So it's a very good predictor for their success and it just goes up a little every month. So very boring company, but very robust. Uh, I like this case. And I hope that more and more companies would publish in an automatic way a key indicator and the more frequently this is done the lower is the potential for things like insider trading if you look at the quarterly reports they often have a big impact like when amazon or tesla report their numbers it can go up or down five or even ten percent even though they're big companies and this is kind of a market failure because the value of tesla doesn't change by ten percent in one day on the information changes. And if they would report their sales daily, you would never see such a big change. I think there are a couple of startups um, that have this built in public and even uh, have a dashboard available for everyone to watch like literally everything that's completely open. Um, yes. Bare it, metrics, it, it. I think. Is yes, it. that's very nice. Yes. Yeah. That would be, the, if we would have one of those in Switzerland, that would be your perfect use case, right? That would be the perfect case for a tokenized company that is fully transparent, of course, this is not realistic for every company because uh, there are things that you don't want to reveal. Yeah. But there should be a key metric in most cases that you can reveal without tipping off your competitors. Or uh, This would be very helpful in establishing a market. So we have to establish the market and the ecosystem on many fronts. So there's the legal front, where we, for example, struggle with tax questions. Yeah. There's the... the internationalization front where we have to ask ourselves well, how can we export what we have developed to other countries that there's the information front where we need to think about how can we inform the public or the shareholders about the companies they're invested in and then there's the market front how can we create a healthy market with a lot of trading volume and so on and then there's the experimental front for, for how can we use all of that so once you have a liquid market that's very valuable and what we see in the stablecoin literature, so the academics, that they say if you are in a position to issue a liquid security, you, you can kind of print money. Because so in a world where you can use any liquid security as a collateral, this security automatically becomes more valuable. So you kind of reap the seniorage gains. Mm -hmm. And these are at the moment very concentrated. And here we come back to more of a philosophical topic of uh, decentralization versus centralization. And today, so there's two ways how 
the central banks shape monetary policy. One is the interest rate mm -hmm. and one is capital requirements. And for example, in the great financial crisis, the European Central Bank and other regulators said, if you buy bonds of, uh, let's say, Greek bonds or other bonds of, uh, of the European government, the risk weight is zero. You can basically do infinite leverage on them as a bank. And this was not because they actually believed that the risk was zero. It's because they thought we want to redirect money into government spending and government bonds to stabilize the system. And just, uh, I think, two or three weeks ago, the European Parliament discussed something and they took a similar decision. They said, if you, as a bank, trade carbon certificates from the European carbon trading system, the capital requirements on that are extra low. So they are using the capital requirements to make politics and not for the safety of the system anymore. And there's also the blind spot that large organizations tend to understand large organizations well, but not so much small organizations. They don't have the attention, like the eye of Sauron. The eye of Sauron can only <laughs> point to one place. Yeah. It cannot understand all the details. It doesn't have that much attention. So that means in a centralized system, the small players are naturally at a disadvantage. And if you are a small player, even if you issue the most safe bond because you're so well capitalized, the system doesn't really re recognize that because you, you don't get a rating from big rating agency and so on. So you don't get the same access to capital. And it means that today's financial system is biased towards the large institutions and the large corporations. They get much better access to capital than the small companies. And this could be turned upside down in a world where there's more decentralized decision taking, where if you have something valuable and you can securitize that or tokenize that and create a market for that, you can use it as a collateral and print money, like with the die system. And then uh, the creation of money is more democratic and, and more decentralized and less biased. And hopefully that also unlocks growth and innovation. But when you say you print money, you, you literally mean like a stable coin or something? Yes. Okay. Because at the end of the day, like our currency, the Swiss franc, is based on the economy that is backed in theory by the economy behind it, right? It's, I know it's more complicated and it's actually with the banks, etc. But to believe in it, the strength of a currency should be backed by the economy. And what you're saying is we could actually really build that now, a true connection, because it would be like... All those little tiny companies that make up for the whole market could be used as a, a little element of a collateral of a stablecoin. Yes, and then this stablecoin would be backed by true economic value. Mm -hmm. And it could potentially be much more safe if the fate of these small companies is not correlated. Yeah. But, but Lucius, how do you do that? That sounds... We, we've gone now in a very high-level uh, philosophical thing but you build something here that is touching like companies. I imagine like getting onboarded to Actionary Art and et cetera is probably not always their first priority. How do you do that when it comes to growth of the company? Because I have a marketing background and I used to also do some sales in a small software service company. And I know it's, it's really hard where you have to, you know, like I talk to restaurant owners, hairdressers, people like that. Yeah. And they, they think differently. How, how do you do that? The answer is I don't do it. I try to find people who can help me do it. For example, with Aktion Riyad, first we were just a team of two, Murat and I, and we couldn't sell our technology. No one wanted to hear about tokenization. Of course, I could bring Quit on board because I was on the board of Quit and could shape the decision a little bit and they trusted me. But it was very hard to sell it. And then uh, Nico joined us current CEO, and he turned that around. So he's much better at doing this. And I'm so glad that we have someone who can do that and who knows how to do all this very hard work and to go out there and spread the message and uh, make sure that, that the message is received. Yeah, I can imagine that it's tough. And um, maybe one last topic I would like to talk with you about, and it's, it's been a long and very interesting conversation is, and it ties in what you said before, the stable coins, maybe also... I think you have a passion for Switzerland and, you know, our country and our laws that seems to be good and our way of navigating the world. 
now you also have your fingers in creating a stablecoin, which is a little bit different, which is actually a Swiss stablecoin. Do you think like the Swiss franc in itself is like a very good currency and you just want for yourself to have this tokenized? So what is the motivation behind that? Yes. So when you look at the uh, user manual for the computer game Command and Conquer, then the world currency is the Swiss franc. Really? Yes. I played Command and Conquer, but four. I think, or... So in Command and Conquer 2 or co in one of the early ones. And when I saw this, I thought, that's an interesting perspective, but why not? And I think the Swiss franc has a lot of potential. And as someone who, who so, so I, I've traveled a lot, but I always love to come back to Switzerland and I want to see Switzerland uh, succeed and the Swiss franc succeed. That's why I also think we don't, shouldn't replace the Swiss franc. We should back it with Bitcoin and make it stronger. And uh, we should also have a decentralized Swiss franc. And this is the Frankencoin project I'm working on from a scientific perspective. And uh, the question, of course, is should we really start with the Swiss franc stablecoin or should we start with a dollar stablecoin? Because there's just a much bigger market. And, and this, of course, it would be very political and the uh, US wouldn't want Switzerland to have a currency that competes with the dollar. But in the end, it, it could be an interesting value proposition to just say we have a very stable currency that is freely usable by anyone who needs it. it I would say that the, also Swiss franc stablecoin issued by the central bank, if it was there, could be a huge success worldwide. Because a lot of people know that Swiss franc is stable, use it as a safe haven and actually has caused our industry sometimes quite some trouble because, uh, you know, it puts pressure on our industries and companies that export out into the world. But we already have stable coins. What makes the Franken coin concept different? I've read that it's not connected somehow to an yes. Oracle. So m my favorite stable coin so far is the liquid US dollar, which was, by the way, also created in Switzerland. Yeah, I had the, the founder recently on the podcast. Yeah, yes. No, the CEO, actually, not the founder. Yes. And the one weak spot they have is the connection to the chain link Oracle. Mm -hmm. This introduces a channel of centralization. And uh, if you know the chain link a little bit, you know that their smart contract is upgradable. It can be upgraded with, uh, I think, four out of nine signature scheme. And no one knows who these key holders are. Mm -hmm. And they don't tell anyone. And this makes it risky. So that means there's nine people out in the world and four of them, if they collude, they could steal billions. Or destroy at least. Or destroy. Yeah. They could, yeah. For example, with, they could trigger a lot of liquidations at a much too low price in the liquidity protocol by manipulating it. So there's a, a fallback, but if they specifically target liquidity, I think they would be able to get around this fallback. So it's one of the single point of failures that we have. Mm -hmm. And my design goal was to, to create something that relies on a different price source. And one choice, of course, could be to have a decent exchange as a price source, but their prices can also be manipulated. What I came up with is to use an auction as a price source. Mm -hmm. And this is something new. Of course, there's other stable coins that use auctions to liquidate assets. But to my knowledge, they don't use it as a price source. So, for example, in the DAI system, once there's a liquidation, there can be a Dutch auction. Mm -hmm. But in the Frankencoin system, the auction is used to determine the price. And there's some clever details that make it safe against manipulation. And I, in my PhD thesis, I take some tools from game theory to analyze that and show that it should indeed be safe if everyone acts rationally. No one has an incentive to try to manipulate the price and bid too high or so. Okay, interesting. So this is your PhD thesis. So you have redone a PhD recently or you, you've done... So, so this is one of the... So I have a master's in economics and one in computer science. And I started the PhD in 2016. And now I have a, normally the deadline is after six years. I extended it by one year and now my strict deadline is in September. Are oh, you you're still on it? Yes. Okay. And I need to now use my holidays mm -hmm. to finish it. Great. And sorry, the PhD was in banking and finance. Banking and finance. Okay. I I, I don't doubt that you will get the <laughs> pass soon and have the PhD. We will see. <laughs>
Well, okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. If you are still listening, chances are that you liked this episode. DeFi is not just me, it's also you, the listener. And each day there are more listeners joining and together we can spread the word about DeFi. By giving it five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening. Send this episode to a friend who might be interested. Check out the website, visit defire.money and click on subscribe to get the new episode and in the future also blog posts directly into your inbox. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at defiremoney. All of this helps so we can continue to produce more episodes more frequently and get the most interesting guests that you deserve. Good night and see you soon.